Hello and welcome round to my house. Now, today I'm going to be joined in the kitchen by one of Scotland's finest chefs, the genius behind Britain's best Italian restaurants. And together we're going to be serving up plate after plate of delicious food for a woman who knows a thing or two about a big breakfast. So what are we doing out here? Let's get cooking. Come on inside. Morning. Are you coming in then? Good morning. Uh, what a show we've got lined up for you today. Today's going to be a special one. We're joined throughout the morning by a good friend of the show and mine. It's Denise Van Elton. She will be here and I'll be visiting the stunning harbour of Newlyn and my food adventures takes me to Cornwall. Top chef Nick Nairn will be here as well. He'll be swapping the Highlands for Hampshire as he takes over the kitchen, a touch later. And don't miss this week's Little Masterclass where I'll be giving you a crash course in my favourite ingredient. I'm so looking forward to this. We're talking crab. And if that hasn't whetted your appetite, then don't worry, because this man will, with his incredible Italian cooking, it's Francesco Mazzi! Welcome back, Chief. Ciao, bellissimi. Now, I've built you up there. I've built you up there. What are you going to be making for us then? Because I've, make... I've spotted a big piece of cheese. Yeah, I just bought a small piece of cheese for you, right. Gran Padano. And basically, I'm going to do fettuccine pasta with the Gran Padano cheese. Basically, we're going to finish the pasta inside the wheel so the cheese will melt. Wow. And we're just going to put a lots of truffle, just making sure you cannot see the pasta anymore. It's so nice inviting you to the house. Yeah, because you never, <laughs> you, you never feed the. the the crew, that's what I'm here for. So yeah. is it seasonal, this, or is it... Where, where does this recipe but this come is, from? But this recipe come, is one of my dishes for um, Taste of London. I'll do this every year, and I will do it again this year. And it's very, very, very popular. We probably sell two, 3,000 portions per day. Wow. So we make fresh pasta from scratch, and we, and we put on, on the wheel of cheese until the cheese gets used and uh, you go to the bottom of it. So this is a flavor. classic way of serving it, is it? It's a classic way of serving it, yeah. But, uh, but when you do, like, uh, for 1,000, 1,000 people um, on the show, it just becomes amazing, you know? It's like the kind of comfort food that everyone wants to try. We're looking forward to that one as well. But we're kicking things off today, uh, not with pasta, but with uh, one of my favourite dishes, which is steamed sponge pudding. Amazing. Do you have such a thing in Italy as steamed um, sponge pudding? No, we've got panna cotta, though. You've got panna cotta? It's not panna cotta. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, let's not have an argument and start... We've got tiramisu as well, right? Listen, it's not panna cotta. Right, okay. Right, okay, it's not sbaglione either. This is, this is miles better. So what does the salt have to see with... The, the, just, the salt's coming in a minute. Just one second. No, it is. Just, it's happening. Right. This, steamed sponge pudding. I wanted to do this because I, I, went, I went for dinner the other day uh, down in Cornwall and uh, the dinner was fantastic. Don't get me wrong, it was wonderful. But they served two steamed sponge puddings with clotted cream, no custard, with clotted cream, salt and uh, a jug of, 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 of syrup, wow. golden syrup with it. It's one of, it was amazing. So I'm going to try and replicate that, really. So classic steam sponge pudding. We've got butter, we've got sugar, we've got flour, and we've got uh, eggs and, obviously, a little bit of golden syrup. So the first thing we want to do is we take this uh, softened butter, a bit like panna cotta. Uh, yeah, panna cotta can be rich as well if yeah. you use double cream. But this... this yeah. Goes you, in the things the mix. that you don't like butter at all, that's the problem. Well, you cannot make this with olive oil, Chief, you know. No? Uh, no, you olive can't oil. make this with olive oil. Don't even attempt it, either. No. So we take white sugar. Now, you can add a little bit of vanilla in this. Um, I don't think it needs it. So we're just going to start this off. Ooh, put this, switch this on. There you go. We're going to pop that on there and then start this machine up. Now, with this, you don't need to beat it up. You're not creating this sort of... You don't whip it, basically, yeah? You don't whip it up that much, really. You can start it off quite low like that. And then while that's happening, we can then turn our attention to our dish, which we're going to butter. So I'm going to take a little bit of this butter. How long are you going to steam that for? This steams for about an hour and a half. Oh, an hour and a half? Wow. Yeah, an hour and a half to about an hour and 40 minutes, something like that. Depends how big Yeah, it is, depends yeah. how big the, the, the pudding is. And as big as you dare to go, really, you've got that massive piece of cheese. If you were going to do one of these massive ones, the problem is, it overcooks on the outside and doesn't cook okay. in the middle. So I see. Yeah, I, I yeah, wouldn't cook yeah. it any more than this. If you're going to do more, then do two at the same time. I see. That's that one. So once you get to that stage, you butter the mould. And I mean butter the mould, butter it properly. Just a bit. Just a little bit. Just to do it properly. A little bit of flour. Fold it in here. Just mould it around like that. And then you can just give this a tap. That's now your buttered and floured mould for your steamed sponge pudding. Right, now in here, so it starts to get a little bit lighter. Yeah. We can white, then start yeah. to add our eggs. 
one at a time. Turn this down a little bit. Sometimes the mixture separates a little bit. It doesn't really matter. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. But the quality of the eggs, look at you got the beautiful Lovely yolks eggs. in there. Mm -hmm. And yolk. Yeah, they go in there. In there. See, I'm surprised the Italians have nicked this one of their own. What's that? Their own. They invented this probably. Then you're going to tell me next time. <laughs> <laughs> then what are we going to do? We we're don't gonna... have butter as good as yours, that's wow. for sure. We don't have olive oil as good as yours either. Yeah. There we go. So we've got a nice little bit of batter. Now, at this point in time, there we go. I can't believe I'm showing Francesco and Matze how to make steamed sponge pudding. But I mean, I love it. I, I mean, never I, thought I, I this can, would happen in my, my life. My daughter will ask me now, Daddy, can you do that? Have you got that recipe? Well, I'll ask Jane. Yeah, well, so, <laughs> the thing about it is, it, well, it goes like that. It goes a bit weird. Uh, but then what you do is you add the flour. So plain flour. There we go. Mix this all together. And you create... And, and I always try and do this bit by hand. Problem is, if you don't and you use the machine, it just toughens up the gluten in the flour. So. You know, in anything, you, you still do with it, with with gnocchi and stuff like that. You don't want to do this in a machine. It can be quite tough. Quite tough, yeah. You're working too much at the Yeah, the you flour. work it too much. Yeah. And what you want to do is just mix this together as quick and as simple as possible. So all this mixed together. And then, before you put the mixture in, golden syrup. Can you use honey instead? No. Sorry. Golden syrup. Golden syrup. Honey, you're just changing the... Just, just no, stick, just stick change, with I'm this. Just checking, man. You'll You've be got fine. the most amazing honey in UK as well. Yeah, right. we have, but we've also got golden syrup. Yeah, good. Just use golden you syrup. You Honey's fine on your toast, just put it in here. <laughs> so, you do this. I'm I tell you, I'm going to go to your restaurant. You've got steamed sponge pudding with honey. I'll just walk out. <laughs> 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 I'm up in a British restaurant very out. soon. So, you know, you know I'm, big, I'm the biggest fan of British produce anyway. Come yeah, on. exactly. So I know you are. But look, we're just going to take this. Now, when you do this, it's important when you get to this stage to do this bit. So you take a piece of paper. My gran used to do this with the Yorkshire Post. She used to take newspaper and do this. Oh, really? Yeah, and you used to end up with a print on the top Perfect. of the... Perfect. <laughs> Very creative. <laughs> this is where you get the, the story of the week was on top of the sponge pudding. This is where you get creativity from, yeah? Nobody uh, could dare tell her. Yeah. It's just what she used I to do. I'm not no, arguing no, with this, fine. So then what we do is you take this and you fold the paper over, like that, and fold it over again. So you want a little crease in it. So the point of this is, as it expands, it doesn't... It's not tight, so as it expands, it follows the paper and puffs up. That's what you want. So when you take this, you can then pop this over, like that. And then we're going to tie it up. And then this is going to steam nicely with the golden syrup, not honey. With the golden syrup, we're going to tie it all up. This will steam nicely. Now, this is what we got to do with the salt, because, as you know, when I started this about sort of two years ago, we started this in the pandemic and I wanted to say all about the amazing producers we have in the UK and a lot were struggling and a lot still are really yeah. but we just started I still remember that vinegar was getting better but we just you know it's a gradually it starts to open up and you must have had the same in Italy as well the producer in Italy it's been a been a nightmare not just for it's hospitality and everything right the way through uh, but we want to showcase all the amazing produce we have in the UK. Uh, and, and so we should be able to go over to Wales to speak to Jessely Nilsson uh, from the Hall & Mon Sol uh, Welsh Salt Company to find out how she makes this amazing salt that's going to go with my uh, steamed sponge pudding. So hopefully you're there, Jess. Are you there? I can see you. I am. Hello. Thanks so much for having me. It's, it's absolute pleasure. So first of all, tell me how this all started, because it didn't start with salt, did it? Uh, so it started at university, didn't it, really? It did. So um, it's actually my parents' company. So um, they they kind of went to university together many moons ago. I won't tell you exactly when, otherwise I'll get in trouble with them, I reckon. Uh, but yeah, they went to university together and to kind of supplement their very meager grant income, they started selling, I mean, I don't know what you'd do, but they started selling fish in the students' union. <laughs> um, and they became um, fishmongers, yeah. basically. Started, started <laughs> selling fish at the, the student union and, and then ended up in Absolutely. fishmongers. I love it. Yeah, crazy story. Absolutely. Then they, they became fishmongers. Um, and then lots of people kept on asking them about the fish um, when they were alive. So they set up a few tanks so that their customers could see the fish when they came to collect the ones that they were going to cook. Right. Um, and this basically grew into an aquarium, into the, the largest aquarium in Wales. Um, so that's where I, I grew up. Love it. Pretty much where I was born. That must have been an amazing childhood, though, wasn't it? Wasn't that lucky amazing, you, darling? Amazing. <laughs> 
It was, it was incredible. Do you know, we've got some great, great stories about escaped conger eels and all sorts. Um, it was a, yeah, it was a great place to live. So when did, when did the salt bit happen? When did that, how long ago have you been, been doing the salt bit? When did that happen? Yeah, so that was in 1997. So basically the aquarium did incredibly well in the summer and, um, you know, there was many thousands of people who visited. Um, but in the winter, it was always a, a little bit tougher uh, to employ people year round. Um, and my mum and dad were sort of desperate to, to keep the staff on year round and offer full-time jobs, essentially. Um, and they thought, what else can we do that is not going to be so reliant on tourism in the summer? Um, and they knew that the water surrounding Anglesey, where we are in North Wales, is incredibly clean because um, they were able to breed seahorses, so which are notoriously fussy. You couldn't write fussy. this story, couldn't you? You bred seahorses. No, isn't it amazing? Love it. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, so, so they knew the water was really, really clean, and they kind of had a bit of a bit of a brainstorm about what else they could do with the water, and sea salt was was one of their ideas. I mean, they had some terrible ideas as well. Don't get me wrong. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, before you tell us about before you tell, you tell us about the salt further, I've got in here. I'm just gonna just gonna steam our pudding because I've tied this all up. Remember to put that little fold in it. The best way to do this, if, I, if you've got a steamer, then it's great. But if you haven't and you've just got a pan like I have, because the lids, commercially, we don't buy lids in the kitchen, do we? No, really? we're not. We don't want because the, the, you, pay more, you pay another 100 quid for a lid exactly. on, a, on, a, on a chef's pan. So what you do is you take a, a tea towel, a tea towel in the bottom of here, and then you just sit the pudding in there, about half immerse it in there, and you can cover it over with tin foil like that, or cover it over with a cloth, and then gently steam this for about an hour and a half. So carry on. How do you go from then, then seahorses, seahorses to salt, <laughs> off you go. Yeah, so the water, they knew the water was very clean because the seahorses were very happy in it. Um, and they thought, what else can we do with it? They thought, let's have, let's have a pop at making some sea salt. Um, and, you know, that was in 1996. Um, and since then, we've sort of become world famous for it. You know, it's, it's all hand harvested. And we've sort of always tried to do things the proper way, the long way, um, you know. So, as I said, each flake is harvested by hand by a very skilled salt maker up here in, in Anglesey. So how do, you, how do you make salt, hand harvest salt? What a great question. Um, so we have a pipeline up here um, in Anglesey, which goes straight from, from the sea to our salt coat, which is the building where we make the salt. Yeah. Um, so first of all, we make really strong brine. So we, we boil the seawater under a vacuum so that the boiling temperature is a bit lower. So we make a really, really strong brine. And then this brine is released into um, what we call crystallization tanks, which are almost a bit like a bar. Wow. Uh, and then we heat, we heat it up again. Um, and then the, the salt crystals, do you know, it's genuinely magic to watch. They, they rise to the surface. And then um, as they get heavier, they drop down a little bit. And then they're ready, ready to be harvested with, you know, with spades um, by our brilliant team. Yeah. So how did... How did uh, hold on a minute. Because, I mean, that's quite... A bit advanced to what I've seen it down in sort of uh, the Camargue, where it's just left on the salt plains and stuff like that. I'm oh. assuming because you don't have the... I, I mean, I love Wales, but it's not the warmest climate <laughs> in the world uh, to then to, to allow it to dry out naturally. Yeah. Yeah, sadly, we don't quite have that level of sunshine, um, but we make up with it, you know, with with our extreme warmth of personality. Um, no, so we do actually use some solar power. Um, so we do we do try and harness the power of the sun in that way. Um, but sadly, we can't do it outside. Well, Jess, Jess, look, Jess, Jess, look at this. Just look at this. Oh, my God. I'm just... È bellissimo. I can't bellissimo, believe bellissimo, bellissimo. Sembra il pan di Spagna, sembra, bellissimo. I've got no idea what he's just said, but I'm it's assuming he's all right. It's a very great sponge. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I've just, I've just took your attention away from this, really. Sorry about that, Jess, but <laughs> it's a thing of beauty, isn't it, really? That's what it is. That's what it is. A bit like when it's, you're making the salt, like you said. So you say it's sold all over the world, and you've gone into different varieties that we've got in here. I'm going to take some of this salt that I've got in here, uh, this, the pure white... So, but tell us about all the other stuff. You've got the smoked one. And this chap's got his, got his eye on the umami one. Tell us, tell us about a few of these. Oh, 
that one is based um, actually on a dish that we we were on a sales trip over in New York visiting some customers out there. Um, and there's an amazing chef out there who'd, who'd um, put this blend, which was based on something his grandfather had done. And it was basically nutritional yeast and some spices with some salt. And he put it on popcorn. Oh, my God. It's so delicious with cocktails. <laughs> uh, absolutely delicious. We're just going to finish this off. With just a little bit <gasps> of golden syrup. Not honey, right? Yeah, no, not honey. Golden syrup <laughs> over the top. And I then, mean, salt of course, is amazing, I mean. we've got some of this amazing salt because I say this about treacle tie. If you ever taste anything that's got syrup in it with go golden syrup, that kind of stuff, if you take sea salt like this, sprinkle it over the top, it <sighs> you makes your taste buds go bang. It's absolutely fantastic. So, Jess, best of luck with everything as well. Uh, and next time Thank I'm over so in much. Wales, I'd love to come and see it as well, as well as the aquarium. But thanks for being a part of this. Please do. Ciao, Jess. Thank Take you care. So Thank much. you very much. So, 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 so there you have it. Steamed sponge pudding, golden syrup with sea salt and clotted cream. Done. Yes. Fantastic. <laughs> So, before I serve you some, I'm just oh going to get a spoon. Just going to get a spoon. That's for me. That's for oh, you. Oh, exactly. Mamma mia. Mamma mia. Que bello. <laughs> Am I allowed to try? Of course you will. Ah, oh, God. And the sea salt as well on top. Watch you going, you'll never go back. Wow, really good. And look at that salt. Yeah, it, that's this lovely balance Tir between the sweet and the saltiness. Tiramisu. 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 Mm. We've got the greatest desserts in the world. Steam sponge pudding. Beautiful, man. 99 really with a flake. Yeah, a little bit more butter would be perfect, but I like it. I love it, I love it. <laughs> oh, my God, it's so good, James. Thank you. And if you're wondering what I'm going to do the other one... You can do the pasta now, I'll keep doing this. That's for me for tonight, but he's gone. Mm. Right, still oh, to come. Oh. We've got a recipe from Mr Nick Nair, and I'll be cooking for my guest Denise Van Elton very shortly, but don't go anywhere, because after the break, Francesco and I will be trying to answer some of your culinary questions. See you in a minute. This is unbelievable. My God, guys. <laughs> Welcome back, and I'll be giving you a little masters in cooking crab a little bit later, and I'll be whipping up a paella for Denise Van Elvery shortly. Uh, but I thought I'd show you this plate, because you kindly give me this. We came off those plates over there. Perfect. So, tell me a little bit about that. He always brings me gifts when he comes in here. That's why he gets invited back again. Yeah, because I want, no, no, because I, want this, <laughs> I just want this wine back. No, no, exactly. It's, but, it's beautiful because it's a lady does this in uh, Amalfi Coast, and they yeah. send me six for me for one of my restaurants, my trattoria, Radici, and Islington. And they go, you're going to have one, because she said, can you please do give this one to people they like, this kind of style? And the fall was perfect for you. I love it. And I, I also know San Marzano is your favourite tomato. It well. is. I'm going to put it on the wall. It's fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Pleasure. Thank you. Right, but first, right, I'm here in the kitchen uh, with Francesco Mazze, of course. Uh, you're going to be cooking for us a little bit later as well, which yep. he's going to be doing. Uh, but the two of us are going to have a go at solving some of your kitchen dilemmas. So hopefully on the line, we should be joined on the line by Steve from Manchester. Are you there, Steve? Yes, good morning, James. Good morning to you. Now, a, a lover of all things. Uh, motorbikes? Yeah. Tick. Pasta? Tick. Tick. Manchester City? Tick. Very big tick. And, and, and a keen di DIY enthusiast. We see everybody's kitchens each time we come to this, but you actually made this kitchen yourself. The whole I, thing behind yeah. you. Yeah. Oh, my own kitchen, yeah. Well, that's... So, and the shelves are straight and they've not fallen over. No, everything's bob on. It's everything's everything's bob on. Absolutely brilliant. So, what what question do you have for us? So, my question is, how do you keep your knives razor sharp? What's the technique? Right. Well, razor sharp knives. It's I mean, you. It, it's a tricky one. This it to get it right. Way. Yeah. It, it's practice, isn't it? More than yeah. anything else. Knowledge, so, practice. Yeah. First of all, we've got a variety of different things in front of us, really, to sharpen your knives. Uh, let's talk about. Take about the whetstones, first of all. They're, they're the classic way to sharpen our knives. You'll find these uh, on uh, on the internet. Um, 
the Japanese sharpening stones. That's all you've got to you, you've got to put on the internet, and you'll get a variety of different ones. Now the colours are not really that important. What is important is on the sides of each colour of these blocks you will have numbers, uh, and usually the lower the number, the more coarse the stones are. So rather than when you're buying it, you buy two sharpening stones. You want really a minimum of three. So you start off. This one's got 400 written on it, which is very very coarse, and then you start going up to 1,000, which is less coarse, and then the finest grain, which I'm rubbing it on there, it's nice and fine, this one's 6,000. So you want a big difference in, in different types of stones. Obviously, if the nice blunt, you start with that one, and then gradually where you finish off this one. The way you do it, really, first of all, is the use of these blocks. And then what you do is you put the stones into the blocks, like that. But what you must do, first of all, is you must wet them first. Just water. You can actually soak the stones in water as well, it's another good idea. But try not to use oil, really, but you want to make sure that they're nice and wet, really. This sits in, in here. Now, this would be the way that Chess would do it. I know you were talking about this earlier. Yeah. You, you've got somebody who comes in and does this in your restaurant yes. as well. They we have the same. The so they would always do this in the restaurant, and we have a, 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 somebody who comes in every, every month and helps the chefs sharpen up their knives, really, when they're doing this. So what you want to do is you start off with a stone, and then the idea is to find this degree. Now, the perfect degree is unknown, really. It's between 15 and 20 degrees, like that. But you hold the knife up, and gradually you go backwards and forwards, right on the stone. And once you've done it one way, you turn it over, and you can do the other way, like that. So you, each time you're doing it, each time you're doing this, you go backwards and forwards, but you must go from top to bottom. So you start off with one end, all the way through like that, and you can either turn it and do it that way, or a lot of people do, is do it that way. Now, to find the perfect degree, like I said, is, is quite tricky. And whether you're doing it that, you start off with the coarse ones and work your way down to the finer ones. That way you'll get the knife really, really sharp. It's, if it's quite blunt, then the best way to do it is in one of these. You'd struggle to do it with a, a steel. You use steels, really, to keep the knife sharp all the time. So the same degree, really, like that, backwards and forwards. You start at one end, all the way down, and work the way through. Some chefs like to work like that. I don't know which way you work. No, I just have to do it a different way. So you do it a different way. You do it that same way, same, yeah, with, same sort with, of thing. With, uh, with the blade on the other side. Yeah, yeah, so it's, that's it's just the more way. like this. Yeah. And, and different steels, you could see from that, that's like a... Uh, an oval shape. You've got the classic sort of round shape really over here. These are what we call diamond steels, these. These are conventional steels, the one with the lines in, which are fine, but nowadays we've got these. Sometimes you get them out of ceramic, which are these. These are fine, but if you drop them, they're broken. Uh, and these are quite expensive. These are about 50, 50 quid. 50, 50 quid yeah. So these are about sort of about 20 quid. But look out for the word diamond steels, and you go backwards and forwards like that. Now, you can use a, a sharpener, which I've got in here which I know you're going to love this, people who don't like the dentist. But you, you start off... And you oh, go through... You. go through, And this, this blade, you can see it, it gives you the perfect shape and angle with the knife. So you've got a rough one on this... rough wheel on this one and a finer wheel on this one as you go. So you start it off and finish it off the finer wheel. Now, if you're trying to get this perfect degree, there is a, a little trick. So we start off with a little bit of paper like that. So what we want to do is you take the paper and you fold it in half. Now that's given you 45 degrees. If you fold it over Clever. again, 45 divided by two. 45 divided by two, 22 and a half. Precisely. Is that a Japanese origami or something? <laughs> no, it's, no, it's just a folded bit of paper. <laughs> so, so it's 20, 22 and a half degrees. If you put that on there, I see. That's roughly the angle that you want to sharpen your knife. Roughly, like that. So you can imagine that. It's a good way to test it. And, and when you're doing this, you can put your knife down there like that, and you can do it that way, to decide where you want to lay the knife or how much the knife should be on the steel. Just gives you an idea and a nice little guide. And one that's just roughly 22 and a half, exactly like that. And so when you sharpen the knife, if you keep the idea of that going backwards and forwards, and one's that way, and one that way, you'll be able to sharpen your knife. But look out for one of these. These are really one of the best ones, apart from the stones. They do it the best, I think. But these diamond steels really are the one. But there's a little tip that you can do with this. But once you've done your knife, whatever you do, don't stick it back under the drawers. You've got, you've got the drawers behind it. You're a DIY fanatic. Why don't you make yourself little cutouts 
for your knives to fit in. Because there's nothing worse. There's nothing worse. You, that's why we have butcher's blocks there, uh, knife rolls. You see chefs with those knife rolls. Because one thing we don't do is put our knives in and you're doing yeah. this and it's just blunting the knives so they rub against each other. So once you do that, you'll see a lot of chefs, they'll put them in a knife roll. Yeah. So they keep them nice and sharp or put them in a block or, or put them on a magnetic rail or something like that, which would look good just underneath that shelf behind your shoulder. <laughs> I, I have a hidden magnetic rail. He's, he's going to put a metal rail up this <laughs> afternoon. There <you> go. <laughs> but there you have it. So that's what you're looking for. That's the best way to sharpen a knife. So if you can do and you've got time, do it on one of these stones. If you haven't, then I would get yourself a steel, but look out for the word diamond steels. And then if you want to do it, I mean, I've got, these are, these are really nice Japanese knives. I wouldn't really use this. They're fine for bits and pieces. A lot of people use these for scissors and bits and pieces. It's probably what they're best used for, yeah. really. But it's just yeah. to give you an idea. But that's a nice little tip to get that sort of degree. That's what you're looking for. But best of luck with that. Thank you. And when I want to put my plate up on the, on the wall, I'll give you a shout. No problem. All right. I'll come around and do it. <laughs> now, Francesco will be cooking for us in a bit. You're going to be cooking? Yeah, fettuccine with the grand banana and black truffle. It's going to taste amazing. We've got Nick Nairn taking it over the kitchen a little bit later. But see you back here in the house in a couple of minutes when there's paella on the menu and I'm cooking it outside for Denise Van Elton. I'll see you in a minute. Welcome back. Now, coming up, I'm off to the southwest of Britain as I, my food adventures takes me to Cornwall. And we've got a masters in crab in store for you later. But first, I'm here with an actor, singer, performer and presenter who has wowed audiences everywhere from the Big Breakfast to Broadway. It's the brilliant Denise Van Alton! Yay! Yay! Wonderful to have you back. I say back because uh, you're, I think, uh, you and Jack Severetti have been here the most amount of times of anybody. I think I'm the lodger now. I've I think you're the in. lodger. Either that or you do it for a takeout, I think. I don't want to cook tonight. I'm just going to call James. And I'll go around to his house for dinner and you can take it home afterwards. It's the best takeout, James. What can exactly. I say? Well, I'm going to give it a go. I, I was looking at the stuff that you like. Uh, two quite tricky dishes, first of all. This is paella and we're going to do beef wellington. So paella, I've just got a selection of different things, first of all. Uh, you can use chicken, it can be classically rabbit, whatever you want really put in this. This is sort of my variation, really. Just running through the ingredients, we've got some chicken, I've got some mussels, I've got some mayo shrimp, which I'll get into in a minute, because they're absolutely amazing. Banging season at the moment. Then I've got some prawns, a uh, little bit of white wine, some herbs, some rosemary, some uh, parsley, tomatoes, smoked paprika, lemon, a bit of garlic, uh, paella rice, saffron of course and then some stock and we'll start off by popping our chicken with plenty of spanish extra virgin of oil into a nice hot pan we'll get that going so first of all congratulations i'm going to say on everything because whenever i switch on the tv there you are mass singer and all you're cooking with the stars cooking with all this sort of stuff bit of everything turning out to a bit of everything i know well i wanted to learn to cook and obviously, lovely Francesco. I know he's a very good friend not of yours. Bad, not bad teacher, is he really? Do you know what? He is amazing. And he was just the most incredible person to work with. Very calm. And, you know, I never really used to cook at home. Being, I was a bit lazy, really. But Francesco, I have to say, made me fall in love with cooking. He made me fall in love with food. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I really enjoyed the experience. And like I said, I learned so much. And I've kept in touch with all the chefs. They're all lovely. And because now I'm trying to do more cooking myself at home, they're constantly sending me recipes and tips on, you know, how to cook properly. And polar opposites, of course, with a mass singer, because I didn't know you were doing that. I know, well, you can't tell a soul. I actually I had mean, to sign... You couldn't tell anybody. I, they make you sign an NDA, right. so you cannot talk about it at all. And I decided that I'd keep it completely quiet from all friends, family, because I thought, if I tell one person, I'll forget who I've told. Right. And, you know, it's very easy for that person to tell someone else. And then I just actually started to quite enjoy you know, the sneaking around and getting into my fox costume and going home and just... At the time, my daughter had no idea that I'd just done a TV show, you know, and I was just getting into it. She's like, where have you Lovely. been? I was like, oh, Mummy's just been to work. Right, an amazing thing to do. And, of course, you know, doing what you love, of course, doing what you're usually out on stage, I've really seen, seen what you're doing, and, and from all manner of different sort of stuff, you've done it... You put it pen to paper and you put it in a book. So tell us about this, then. This is... Because how on earth do you fit your life story in... There's, there's got to be a second one, because... You've done a bit of everything. I have indeed, yeah. So it's my autobiography, a bit of me. It actually came about because in the first lockdown, I was talking to my mum on the phone. You know, we all have plenty of time on our hands. Yeah. And I started asking my mum questions just about what I was like as a child and I wanted to know about how my parents met. And, and then I just said to my mum, would you mind writing everything down for me? Because I'd love to keep it. Right. 
right. you know, so that I can, you know, in the future go back and reference it and show my daughter as well, you know, yeah. just how my parents met and, you know, their first date and everything. And that's how it started. So my mum sent that over to me and I thought, well, these, this will be the early years. And then I thought, I should just do an autobiography. And actually, I was really worried that I wouldn't be able to remember very much, cos you know what it's like when you're so busy? Plus, you've got to factor in the 90s. Yeah. What, what <laughs> which, you mean, the blurred bits? <laughs> the blurred bits. <laughs> I was like, how much will I remember? Cos that's when I first... I think that's when I first met you as well. Yeah. Cos it, it was a great time. I'm just going to recap what we've got here. We're going to talk Go on, about you do the book that. as well. But, but look, you can have a glass of wine while Thank you're doing you. that. But we've got in here, we've got the uh, onions, garlic, the chicken's gone in here. Now you take the rice. So this is obviously paella rice, but... The idea is you just pour this, and when I learned how to do this in Spain, I mean, different. there's different variations of it, of course, that kind of stuff, but you just, once you stir the rice a little bit, the key to this is then leave it. You're not allowed to stir it until it's finished. Uh, and then we add the different sort of spices, so it's entirely up to you. This is where recipes vary massively. Smoked paprika is one of them, so pimenton, literally, smoked paprika. And then we've got some saffron, you have to be careful with this sort of stuff. I would urge on the caution with this saffron. So often with paella, it can be sort of glow in the dark. It's like a, a, a spray tan. You know what I mean? It can be just horrendous <laughs> things. It a can Friday be, night in Essex. Well, it could be just, it, it could be like, you know, like a Japan orange. It's unbelievable <laughs> thing. But you just, want, you just want a little bit of it. Then you add a little bit of liquid, and that comes in the form of water, stock, a little bit of wine. It's entirely up to you. And I'm going to put some herbs and some rosemary and bits and pieces. The reason why I'm concentrating on this one is you mentioned your parents. You, you're actually going to take this one away for your folks, aren't you? I this, will do for Kath and Ted, who are looking is, after is, my dogs at the moment. This Bless is for them. their supper for later. So tell us about how on earth do you put all these stories into, into pen to paper? Well, then I just sort of went back over the 90s and just my career and people that I've worked with. And I thought, because you know what it's like? I always thought, people are not interested in my life. But then I realised that I've worked they with... Are. Well, then I realised I worked with some very interesting people, so it was really nice to, to document, you know, all the experiences that I've had and the amazing, incredible people that I've worked with, like um, Andrew Lloyd Webber, you know, and, and the, when we create the show together that I did on my own. It's just a... It seems to me that, you know, when you mentioned your parents, you've got... Every time I see you, and, and we're talking 20, 30 years ago, I've known you, that your drive... You've got you've got a drive in you that that you know the the focus and the drive. Where does that come from? Does that come? Do, from... do you know what? I just feel like if I want to do something, nothing will stand in my way. I just want I want to do it and I want to complete things. Um, my drive, I think, and work ethic probably comes from my parents. I mean, my parents are in their late seventies and they've still got part time jobs. They still love working. Right. It's just an old East End thing, I think, being an old London East Ender. Is it something that you always wanted to do in terms yeah. of? doing what you've done, because you've done a variety of different things, but still, I get the feeling that theatre keeps giving you the dri drive back. And it must be quite quite therapeutic doing something like this, would it? It's or... amazing, actually, to write everything, also to really appreciate the experiences. Because, to be honest, even when I did was on Broadway, it was not long after I'd had my heart broken. So, at the time, I remember it as an experience that the show was amazing, but I was, at the time, personally for me, I wasn't in a great place. But actually now when I look back, so I, didn't, I wasn't really appreciating what I was doing at the time. Because, you know, when, when you've got heartbreak, every, it takes over everything. And it was only really when I started to work on the book that I'd... All the experiences of being in New York and living there on Columbus Circle, in the Trump building and walking to Broadway to do my show. And I really appreciate it now. And I think that's the nice thing about when you write it and you start to really appreciate your experiences, even the bad ones, because they shape you as a person. So look at this, Denise, look at this. Oh, James. It's a pot of loveliness. Oh, it's the pot of heaven. Look at that. And then you finish this off with some parsley over the top. I love this sort of stuff. It, I mean, I know you love Spain. Anyway, um, but this is just... It's just one of the nicest dishes, isn't it? You it's just... the best. It just reminds me of holidays and sunny days. Yeah, Lovely. Sunny days, uh, but this will remind you of Hampshire. Um, but we're going to take take a little bit of lemon. I'm just, I like a little bit of lemon squeeze on the top. Now, oh, certain paellas, they, they can be meat-based. They don't have to be fish-based. If you go north of Spain, it can be rabbit and that kind of stuff. Uh, but this a combination of chicken. You can use thighs. But the key to this, and I want you to look for, is these amazing prawns, the mussels, but also in here we have these mayor prawns. These are... Look at these. It's almost like a pitcher. These are only available in the UK about four months of the year. And these are from Falmouth. They, they use traditional fishing boats. They catch them in pots. They're absolutely beautiful. If you can get hold of them, like I said, only for a short period of time, 
But if you didn't want to do something like this, you can steam these, steam them with beer. If you just take some beer, don't do it a lager, because that's not the same, but if you take some beer, put it in a pan, put them into a colander or a, or a sieve, something like that, if you haven't got a steamer, cover with tin foil, steam them for about two or three minutes, open them up with lemon juice. Amazing. Oh, sounds Maya delicious. Prawns. They're absolutely delicious. But we're going to serve this old school. Uh, and the th key to this as well, like I was saying, you, one thing you don't want to be doing with the paella is you don't want to be stirring it. So once this goes in, you leave it. And the idea behind it, it gets this crust on the bottom. Uh, and that crust is what you want. So when you scoop it out, you scrape off the crust. So you get the difference in sort of flavours with it, well with it. But I'm just going to leave that on there. I was going to put it in fact. We'll put it in a little plate for you. We'll that it looks little, little so serve. good. It looks really nice, doesn't it? And, yeah. And you can just take a nice little chunk. And we've got this crust. I can feel that the crust is on the bottom. But look, you've got the chicken, the rice, and I like it when it's not too dry. You've got a little bit of moisture in there with these beautiful, beautiful, look at the prawns. <clears throat> wow. That goes with it. But there you have it. So on my version of a classic paella. Oh, plate of Easy dreams. Bon appetit. Yeah. Easy as that. Bon appetit. Oh, this is so exciting. <laughs> this looks so good. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you at the house. Oh, Anytime you know I you love want. coming here. Well, I've got, I can't eat all this because I realise this is for your mum and dad, so I'll just have a little taste of the side bit, really. Right, making sure I get a muscle. Mmm. That's good. So good. So good. That's good, isn't it? This is the best one I've ever had. That's good, that. and mm. you're not even in Spain. No, I know. Well, I'm going to tell you a little secret. I, I, I have a doctorate in making paella, apparently. Well, I don't know. I did it in about an hour and a half. They gave me a certificate when I was on a, a bus trip. But anyway, there you go. <laughs> we did it for filming, but that's it. That's true. Sorry. <laughs> Maybe the Spanish going to be screaming at the TV show. I've been doing it wrong for the last 10 minutes. But anyway, there you go. Right, I've got a second course of beef Wellington in store for Denise a little bit later on the show. And I'm off on a food adventure to New Lynn in Cornwall very shortly. But join me after the break when it's the turn of Genius Chef and your own mentor, Mr Francesco Mazza. He's here in the house and he's got a massive wheel of cheese. See you in a bit. I thought you were going to say something else then. I know, I was going to say something else. <laughs> it's cheese, it's cheese. <laughs> Welcome back. Now I'll be sharing some cracking ideas for crab in this week's Little Masters. I'll be treating my guest Denise Van Allen to Beef Wellington a little bit later. But first, I'm here with it in the kitchen with a chef, in fact two chefs, but one of which is world-class Italian food, is welcome at my house any, any time. It's the brilliant Francesco Mazzi! <laughs> Mr. Nick Nairn has sneaked in. I know the reason why you've sneaked in, because you walked in here, you saw the massive bit of cheese, you wanted lunch, that's the reason why you're here. That's, isn't that's it? why I'm here. And, and why not? not? And why not? Why was I trouble? <laughs> so we've got our knives and forks ready, our knives and spoons ready, we've got a nice glass of wine, uh, we've got the best Italian chef in the business cooking for us. Off you go. Well, I'm going to do fettuccine with uh, gran padano and black truffle. As you can see, of course you few are. little ingredients here. Yeah. This is for the pasta, and then we're going to finish the, cheese, the pasta inside the cheese. But I'm not going to make the pasta because it will take half an hour, but we made some pasta so ready for you. you. How would you make this? So th this is what, double zero? This is double zero and uh, semola. It's yeah. basically under 50 gram, under 50 gram. Semola and three flour. That's the... Semola flour. Okay. Semola flour. Right. As far as I know, I've probably got 25,000 different recipes of pasta. But Is that's there? definitely the best, James. And they're all the best ones, I presume. Oh, of course. Everyone. 25,000 recipes, all the best. Yeah. And I'm going to make you happy. I'm going to use butter in this recipe, you know oh, that. Sounds good to yeah? me. Yeah. Right, look at this pasta. Beautiful. Um, I'm using uh, also English eggs, you know? Clarence Court eggs, beautiful. Well, produce. you're a big supporter of the... I mean, we have great produce in this country. But... I mean, honestly, when I first came here in London, it was in 1996, I was trained at the Dorchester, it was difficult to find extra virgin olive oil. Yeah. Now you find everything. Yeah. I mean, I grow my rocket, my basil, as you know, in, uh, in UK. Please, I mean, what, was, what was the phone call like when you went to your family, going, I said, I'm going to leave Italy and I'm going, I'm going to the UK to, to, to cook the food? Yeah, that I mean... Must have, that must have been an interesting conversation. Yeah, it's such a conversation with my father as well. What? To Britain? <laughs> I mean, did they cook over there? I said, Daddy, Roast I mean, it's the most amazing crowd in the world. I'm going to learn English. 
which of course didn't work, as you can tell. Yeah. But, <laughs> but to be honest with you, it was uh, it was amazing because then I discovered the great things you guys had. I mean, but uh, London, London in the '90s when you first came here, I mean, it was the, already on that that momentum was going. It yeah. was almost in fourth gear. Now it's gone crazy. It's gone crazy, but it, it, you believe it or not, 1996 there was not any great Italian restaurants. There was a lot of good French restaurants. Yeah. But Italian restaurants, I remember like Spaghetti House. Which, with all respect, they they they're nice people, but was not <laughs> was not really you know spaghetti you bolognese. To, I mean, still to cook me alphabet alphabet spaghetti. Oh yeah, I will do that one for you one day. But <laughs> I keep asking for it. He keeps ignoring me. <laughs> like he is now. Why? <laughs> when you could have truffle and uh, parmesan. Yeah, exactly. But now is basically um, the capital of food. I mean, if I ask you, it you is. want a good Japanese or good Chinese or good French, you get all the best. What else right. in the world that happened? I mean, probably nowhere. Yeah. You see? So, so this, I love this. This is. And then the reason I've got this big cheese is because I'm going to feed the crew, which you never do as well. That, These guys, that, they work so hard. Crew and guests. And you. And guests. Really? Oh, of course. Yes. Really? I mean, of really? course. <laughs> yeah, that's. It's a big piece of parmesan. They bring me to the crew. pizza one, one day. Do you believe that? I'll, guys, I promise I'll do it. Yeah, I'll do it for you. <laughs> yeah, they look starved. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to make this very thin. Look at that. So the idea is you work your way down, and I'm assuming you want this the thinnest setting. You want very, very thin. Thinnest setting, and I'll show you why. Because you need to be able to see your hands through when you do pasta. I mean, of course, when you do ravioli, James, uh, you can do a little bit thinner, but that's the way you should really keep your pasta, right? Yeah. Nice and silky and beautiful. Okay. So once more, and then we can uh, do the dish together. Look at this. This is also. Nice. Look at that, beautiful. It's just a thing of beauty, it really is. Yeah. Just to see the, your outline of the hand through yeah. it, the color, the texture. Yeah. It's that silkiness that gets that amazing taste. You see, it's the best cooking in the world, man, you know that. You should open an Italian restaurant one day, James, you know? Do you want me to do, do, you want me to do the other one? Uh, can you? No, I think there's enough for you, for two, you, you, two of you. Well, I would have been the two, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry, guys, you know. I didn't forget about that. <laughs> That was quickly forgotten about you, <laughs> not, <laughs> <was> it? <laughs> Come on, you know how much I love you. Look yeah. how much cheese I bought for you here. Very, very quickly forgotten. So while you I'm doing this... cheese to be Scotland as well, right? While well, I'm will. doing this then, t tell, us, tell everybody about your restaurants. Because well, I, your uh, restaurants are yeah. amazing. So. Yeah, I mean, I've got three... running three restaurants in London. One, you, you, James comes all the time, which is not true. And then I've got Sartori, uh, Radici, which is a trattoria in Islington. And then I've got Fiume in Battersea Power Station, a new development, which is a bit like... Uh, Amalfi Coast kind of uh, inspiration, like the same. Amalfi Coast meets the River Thames. Are you? Uh, yeah, yeah, of course, of course, with a lots of uh, <laughs> He's lots of imagination. There, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So we got this pasta here. We're gonna just roll it nicely. And so you're not do... you're not cutting it through a cutter through this no, machine. No, it's boring. I'm gonna do it like that. You know. But and you put cut. the semolina to stop it sticking. Yeah, yeah you put semolina sem to stop sticking as well. And you believe it or not, the pasta's got different texture when you cut by hand. Um, yeah. And it's much more uh, real, if you see what I mean. Okay, one more here. Thank you. It's very kind of you, James. It's all right. Look at that. Bellissima, bellissima. There you go. You see? You could wear that like a scarf. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, this is what I do on a Sunday. <laughs> <I'm not sure. laughs> you just chuck that to one side, or are you going to use it? Uh, no, it's enough, man. <laughs> I don't like yours. <laughs> Maybe the Italian Thanks. hand. Cheers. <laughs> you know, this pan, can you just... Just roll it up with no, two portions. You. Two portions. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, look. So this tell, is a... me, tell me about the cheese then. This is this is. The, t tell me about this this well, cheese. This is, uh, you know when people say is uh, uh, parmesan. I mean parmesan is very generic. I mean parmesan doesn't really mean anything if you see if you talk to, to, to an Italian. There is a parmigiano reggiano and grana padano. This is the grana padano. The difference between the two is like parmigiano reggiano is made with food fat, food fat milk, and this one is like skimmed milk, and it's also gluten free, and it doesn't age more than 26, 27 months, okay. and parmigiano Reggiano goes up to 36 months and more. So that's, uh, so would, that's the difference. The, the Reggiano be stronger? In terms stronger, of and be more grainy. Yeah. Um, this one is slightly lighter, and uh, I prefer to cook with this one, especially when it's kind of a uh, recipe, because if you know, it gets quite, uh, quite rich and very strong, right? Because Nick, I know you're a big fan of Italian food, are you? Uh, absolutely, I love the simplicity of it. I love when you get it just right. It... They're quite modest, though, do you think, the Italians, when it comes to... Uh, very shy, I'd be very shy. <laughs> <laughs> don't trust yes, it. Yes, James, very don't modest. Trust yeah, exactly. yeah. And don't, they don't love French it. cooking and they love uh, Spanish yeah. cooking. They love yeah, right. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Butter. <laughs> look, what? Look, look, look how happy he is. Yeah. Actually, you know what? With the olive oil. Is that Italian? Yeah. Oil? The olive oil is... There's... Come on, man, it's Greek olive oil. 
<laughs> How are you going to do this Especially for me? for you. <laughs> That's not fair. That's not me, fair, I can man. tell you. It's, got terri it's a terrible wine, this one. It's his wine. It's terrible. No, this is You're going to put some nutmeg <laughs> in it, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, 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 yeah. OK, so butter is melting with a bit of sage. Yeah. Uh, nutmeg here. So, obviously, Italy, you're, you're t tell everybody whereabouts in Italy you're from because you're hugely passionate about the ingredients from that neck of the woods. Yeah, I'm uh, Calabrese, from the south of Italy, Calabria, known for the most amazing, soft, spreadable salami called Induia. Yeah. Yeah. Bravo. <laughs> I love this guy very much. It's yeah. really, you know. It's known for the Godfather, though, as well, isn't it? All no, that's Sicily, man. All right, sorry, Sicily. Man. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I've got Sicilian wife, I should be careful what I'm saying. Yeah, exactly. I've been traveling. The horse's head has been delivered as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. OK, look, this butter is uh, on the fry point, so but we don't want this to become a brown butter. So we're adding a bit of uh, water from the it's pan. It's just melted butter, is this? Yeah, right? yeah. So in there you've got melted butter, sage and nutmeg. And nutmeg, that's it. Simple as that. Yeah. And you use yeah. the water from the pasta because it's yeah, got because the starch. It's full of starch, but I've got some stock as well. So it depends sometimes, but this to make it very, very simple. And of course, we want people to be able to do this at home as well. Well, you said do this at home because you, last time you were here, did the meatballs. The, the oh, meatballs yeah. were... Remember them. I've got to say, it's probably been the most popular dish we've ever, ever had on. I mean, everyone asking for that recipe, I say, it's, on, it's online, I, no? I think you plan your guests around your day's eating. Yeah. <laughs> do you think I'm crazy or what? Exactly. No. I've suspected it for a while. 30 but... years I've been doing this. It's, it's, yeah, it's yeah. not my first you know rodeo, you know? Like... No, I know. Exactly. So, but, but that, I mean, the, the, the other dish, but the dish that I keep asking for, that you keep forgetting about, and, and, you know, I like pasta, don't get me wrong, I love it. But this, this pizza. Oh, we can do pizza next time, man. Eh? But as soon as summer comes kicks in, we can do pizza outside. But you have to bring your your yeah. your pizza guy, no? Well, because you think I cannot make it? Well, no, no. just say, just say. You, well, actually, you say. I'm not good at stretching pizza, but you know. I'll bring my pizza guy. Yeah. Really? <laughs> we have a pizza. Should off. we do a Scottish Italian pizza? I think. Uh, he's he's half Italian. Ah, uh, okay. He's Glasgow Italian. Glasgow Italian. <laughs> Glasgow Italian. <laughs> Paul sounds uh, interesting to me. You know, <laughs> pizza Paul. Okay, look. So we got this. Uh, the pasta with the butter here. Uh, we're going to add so more. So you don't cook your, That's cooked for a minute. A minute, yeah. Lovely pasta. But it can still cook here a bit, a bit longer. OK. OK. So we need the, the, the pasta. You know, this water is full of starch now. And we want this pasta to release the starch as well. OK. Now, a bit of black pepper. Oh, pepper. So you're making this look very effortless. It's but easy. that ratio of the water and the fat and everything. We all is... know that. If you do this at home, you put too much water in it, you've no. not got enough water. Uh, what you do is this, this is the bit. This is what you do at the end. Keep mixing. What you're gonna so do, you, you have, have to, to do sheet. this while it's still hot. Yes. Yeah. But what you can do, if you think when it gets a bit, you think it gets cold, just add a bit more water. And then you do like this, all around it, so the cheese will melt around it as well. OK, as you can see, I didn't put any salt because it's quite rich over there, and there was salt, of course, on the, on the you, pasta water, right? Can you imagine this for a dinner party? Yeah, I mean... Just everybody <laughs> sitting around, and, you know, it's... No, it's a great show, and people love... And, you know, you can do it in front of them, rather than, you know... You don't invent anything, just you do it in front of them. You take a fondue machine, you put it in the bin, and you get a, <laughs> wheel, of, you get a wheel of Parmesan. It's fantastic to look at. So, the, ma the amount of money you spend on the, on, the, on the fondue machine is just to buy a wheel of cheese. <laughs> OK, How about that, cheese. right? So, now, we're going to... Finish the dish for those two gentlemen here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, look at that. What we're going to do? Simple as this. All right. You see? Simple food, but look great. Okay. Look at this. The, the amount of time with these pasta lifted things. <laughs> exactly. Well, you Another just thing for realize, the <laughs> ladle, a ladle, and, oh. and, and yeah. how many times are you doing that? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Or a bard and fork, you know. Yeah. The, yeah. The but look here. at the sauce. The sauce is, is uh, thick like a... Yeah. Yeah, it's very cheesy, right? Yeah. It's beautiful. Look at that. What could you add to that that could make that better? Uh, there is something we can. There is something we can. A little bit more cheese. And why not, if I find it, black truffle? This is what we call Italian cooking, Jerry. Italian cooking. Is that a beauty? Yeah. Three ingredients. You say three ingredients, but three ingredients cooked by one of the best Italian chefs in the world. Simple as that. You can pay me later. Francesco, everybody. <laughs>
Right, I'm looking forward to this. Ooh, uh, taste. Try this one. Wonderful. This Nick, one. Go. Enjoy you. your lunch. I'm just going to start looking at this, driving it out of here. Uh, you see? Did they want to give me the uh, plate? It's very I'll show you now. Look, can you see my pasta there? Look at the draw that too for. Stuff very one. extravagant, but no, why not? I'm coming here every day. Mmm. 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 That is just sublime. one of the nicest pastas I think I've ever just tasted. Sublime, honestly. Just How three ingredients. A three ingredient. I get the thing about the grana. Do you know it's more subtle? Like the, yeah. But you see yeah. the little, little bit of the nutmeg, the sage, the truffle, you can taste all these ingredients. And that's the great thing. Simplicity. Simplicity. With a bit of butter, I would say, James, though, because you. That, that is stunning, isn't it? I don't say this lightly. That's one of the nicest pastas I've ever tried in my life. Well, I didn't agree what? with you. But there is a better pasta dish than this. There's not. There is. White sliced bread, out of the toaster, buttered, spaghetti hoops on toast. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. The Francesco Matto! <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was going to hit me then. Uh, right, <laughs> still, more, still more brilliant cooking to come from this chap over here, Nick Nairn, and I'll be chatting some more with Denise Van Elton. But after the break, I'm heading to the fishing port of Newland in Cornwall for another one of my favourite food adventures. Spaghetti hoops. <laughs> it's a lot cheaper than this. Welcome back. Now, I'll be teaching you everything you want to know about crab in this week's Diddle Mask class. And I'll be rustling up an amazing beef wellington for Denise Van Elton very shortly. OK, it's time to take a look back at one of my favourite ever food adventures. This week, me and my mini are heading down the A303, which is a long, long, long road, all the way to Cornwall, to make a dish of deep-fried sole in the stunning surroundings of Newlyn Harbour. Enjoy this one. Now, there are many dishes that you can do with some fantastic fish like this, caught from these amazing fishermen that are out here. But I thought I'd do something really simple, and for that, you can look at tapas. Look at the Spanish style of cooking. And the reason why I wanted to do that was using some of this Megrim sole, because, like the fisherman was saying, and, and the fishmonger, most of it, in fact, nearly all of it from here, is sent over to Spain. So I'm going to do this fantastic little sort of tapas-style thing, really simple with a nice little dressing. So the first thing we do is get a little bit of white wine to cook some simple little mussels. No shallots, no thyme, nothing, just some white wine. Throw in these wonderful local mussels. And we're going to cook these just simply, because it's the juice that I want from this, it's the important bit, that's going to create part of our sort of little batter. Now, running onto the fish, this is this wonderful little megrim sole. You can tell from the colour it's megrim, because it's just lighter. But all sort of sole have this particular thing called a skirt. So just take a knife and cut the outside of this off. You can leave it on if you wanted to, but it's nicer, actually, if you just take it off. Like that. I've got this beautiful monkfish here. The same thing applies for this, really. So, monkfish, we're just going to trim this either side. They call this the bone, but it's basically just a little bit of cartilage that sits in the centre, like that. So we've got these nice chunks of fish, really, which is perfect. All the while, my mussels are cooking away nicely. They just want a couple of minutes. Lose our board. Wash your hands. I've got to do that myself. Like this. Now... The mussel just, just starting to open up, so we don't want to overcook these because I'm going to deep fry this entire dish, really. And rather than create a batter, I thought I'd deep fry it in just a simple combination. I've got in here semolina flour mixed together with a bit of plain flour. Now, you can spice this up if you wanted to, just a touch of cayenne pepper, like that. And this is really the coating for our fish, but what we need is the glue, and the glue for the coating comes in the form of this. These mussels are there, really, now, so we'll just lift this off. And then just to keep the oil nice and hot, I'll pop this back on. But I want this mussel juice, so we're going to take a little bit of the juice out like this. And then simply, all I'm going to do, really, with this, is just pick the mussels. Now, while I'm doing this, the director likes to cut away to pretty things. So off you go. I'll see you in a minute.
right, sorted. Muscles are all done. So I'll leave this to one side. Meanwhile, into this, I'm just going to add an egg. So just take a little bit of egg. This is the glue part of it. And then all we're going to do is take our monkfish. That's going to go in. And then grab our semolina and flour mixture. So using the mussel juice, you just roll in your nice pieces of monkfish, like that. And you can do this with any fish, really. Pop your lovely megrim sole in. And you get so much flavour from this juice, from the mussels. So I'll wash my hands again. And then we get the nice hot pan, and it's really, really hot. At home, deep fat fryer is best. So the fish is just going to get popped in the deep fat fryer. We're going to cook this for a couple more minutes. Now, while our fish is cooking, I'm going to do the same thing with the mussels and coat them all. So this monkfish looks about there. Take this out. It's a good idea, this, even if you've got an electric fryer at home, to do this in batches. Otherwise, the minute you put anything in it, just the temperature decreases. The oil for this is about 190, 200 degrees. So finally, we'll pop some of this amazing megrim sole straight in. So straight in the fryer. Another piece. And then in there, I add the mussels. Now, it's important because the mussels are cooked to make sure the oil is really hot. This is going to take about a minute now. So the fish, we could just simply lift out. Because the megrim sole is so thin, the cooking of it is so quick, but particularly the mussels. You see there, you don't want to overcook these mussels. They've already been cooked once, otherwise it's like chewing on bullets. Lift it all out. And then we can turn our attention to the dressing for this. Now, I'm not going to Spain for this dressing. I'm not going for the UK. I'm actually going to go a little bit of Mexico for this one. This is just creme fraiche and chipotle chili, which is like a, a smoke-dried chili. Like that. Mix it all up. Bit of black pepper. Bit of salt. Bit of salt on the fish. But that's it. And then to serve it, we buy the seafront, so we've got to use the Cornishman. Pasty scheme is driving us around the bend. You've got to have fish like this in newspaper. You can take me to Spain, but you have to have fried fish in newspaper. Bit of that. And then just a little bit of this creamy dressing. And then just to finish this, deep fried parsley and a little bit of lime. Now, the idea of this is not to wash the parsley before you start filming. That's the reason why. Suede jacket. So we deep fry the parsley. What happens to it? It goes like little translucent. And then finally, we'll grab some lemon or lime. It's up to you, but just a little bit of lime zest, I think, over the top. It's so good with this. It makes it taste fantastic. A few wedges of lime, why not? In amongst it. This parsley, when it goes translucent, it goes crispy. We can take our crispy fried parsley over the top. And there you have it. A little taste of Spain via Mexico in Newlyn. Cooked by a Yorkshireman. Confused? So am I. But it's a combination that works perfectly. My super fresh seafood tapas with chipotle dressing. Seaside bliss. Still to come, Mr Nick Nairn will be making a welcome return to the kitchen and Denise Van Elton will be back for lunch a little bit later. But before that, after the break, we've got a masterclass in crab that you definitely don't want to miss. It's a good one.
Welcome back. Now, I'll be making the perfect beef wellington, or trying to, for, for Denise Van Elton, very surely. And Chef Nick Nairn will be here with a cracking chicken recipe next. But first, it's time for this week's Little Masterclass. And this week's Masterclass is all about, and I'm going to be honest with you, this is my favourite, favourite ingredient. It's crab. Now, the subject is massive. There are over 62 different types of crab alone just in the UK. So the subject is huge. They're caught all over the globe, and we're going to go through a few of them anyway that we've got on here. So we've got the classic brown crab, available all over the UK, which differs to the sort of the chroma crab of Norfolk, which is slightly smaller. These are amazing. These are called sand crabs. These are what you used to do when I used to do this in Whitby and, and uh, in Scarborough with a, with a bucket. Tend not to do that now, my age, but you know the ones where you catch them in a little bucket uh, with your bucket and spade? Those ones, these are amazing for sauces uh, because the shells you can actually blend. So if you were to put those into a pan with some uh, fennel, some onions, some tomato, that kind of stuff, a little bit of water, some cream, and then blend it in a food processor, pass it through a sieve, this creates the most amazing sauce with crab. Then you've got these ones over here, soft shell crab. Absolutely delicious. Beautiful tasting as well. One of my favourite, favourite things, they call these bubba crabs in the south of uh, America, in the deep south, which I've had before, or blue crabs you see over there. But these are sort of time Pacific when they're caught. And the reason for that is where the shell molts from the hard shell to the soft shell. So they usually go out and catch them all then, like I said, in a very short space of time. And that's why most of them that you'll get are frozen. Because <clears throat> when you get these in America, and I've had these in the deep south, they can be fresh as well, but absolutely delicious deep fat fried, which I'm going to do now. So I'm going to do some of my favourite dishes. Crab on toast, really. This is this is kind of my version of sort of a potted crab. So what we do, first of all, is take some bread, some just some nice sourdough. What we want to do, first of all, is toast this bread, first of all. So get some sourdough, little drizzle of extra virgin olive oil over the top. And I've got a griddle on here. You can toast this if you wanted to, but we're just going to sort of toast this on the little griddle over here. It gets a lovely little flavour to go with it. So a little bit of oil over the top. And that'll quite happily sit there. Meanwhile, let's talk about our potted crab, which is very similar to sort of potted shrimp, really, but without the addition of mace, which is another thing you add to potted shrimp. But obviously, we start off with some butter. Proper butter. All right, then we can then put our white and our brown crab meat in. So I'm going to show you where this comes from on the crab anyway, really, but we've got some picked white crab meat over here, which is really the highly prized crab meat, I suppose, the white crab meat, as opposed to the darker one, which is much, much stronger in flavour. But the addition of this in dishes will make a lot of difference, and this is where I think you get this really punchy flavour of crab, but you use a little bit less of it. If you're making a mayonnaise, for instance, something like that, and you put this in it, it tastes amazing. If you make a mayonnaise and put that in it, it doesn't taste as good as this. But if you make a mayonnaise like a crab salad, a little bit of this, and fold it through white crab meat, amazing as well. So <clears throat> we've got that mixture. Then we're going to add the addition of some spring onions. So this is more sort of an oriental sort of mixture. But you can mix and match whatever you want. You can just put a little bit of lemon in there if you wanted to. But this on toast is absolutely delicious. So that's just, that's toasting away nicely, lovely. Meanwhile, we've got some coriander. But with the coriander, we use the entire thing. So don't just use the tops of the coriander. We use the entire lot, stalks and all. Use that. <coughs> Pop that in there as well, like that. And then some chili. It's entirely up to you how much or how little. But put the whole thing in. I don't understand why people still to this day take seeds out of chilli. I've got no idea. When you ask them, they go, I don't like it. Oh, what are you putting chilli in for in the first place? Just, just madness. And we mix this together. Like that. And this is your potted crab, you see? Like that. Using your hands are far, far better. I remember the wonderful two fat ladies. Do you remember those? Wonderful pair. They used to sort of mix this together with their hands with the rings on and get so many complaints. Life's too short, as we all know. Look, like that. And then, quickly wash my hands. So with the bread itself, we're just going to get a nice little bit of toast, like that. Nice and simple. 
Now, with this, you want a dish that you're going to cook it in and serve it in, because the whole point of this, this butter melts, it goes into the bread, it's just you eat the entire thing. So you take your bread like that, pop it on here, and take a decent amount of this. And when I say a decent amount, that is a decent amount. Because what's going to happen with this, it's going to melt at the same time as well. And the idea is this, as it melts, the, the sort of crab sticks onto the bread and the butter sort of oozes out of it as well. But you get this amazing flavour. Don't forget that little bit of chilli we've got in there. So quickly wash my hands again. There, once we get to that stage, so you can pop this into a pot if you wanted to, which is wonderful. You can even take that, roll it up, put it in the fridge, and then if you've got a pan-fried bit of fish, you could slice a bit of it, put that on top of the fish when it's cooked. A bit of white fish, just delicious. And then what we're going to do is just pop this straight in the oven. It takes about four or five minutes just to warm up in the oven. That's going to go in. Meanwhile, over here, we then turn our attention to a soft-shell crab. So soft-shell crab, standard sort of batter for this one. We can add a little bit of coriander to this if you wanted to. It's entirely up to you. You can leave this plain. I've had so many different types of variety of soft-shell crab over the years, but a little bit of that, a little bit of lemongrass as well. You can put lemongrass in that one if you wanted to, but just a little bit of lemongrass is really nice. There we go, in there. A little bit of lime zest into there. A nice pinch of salt. There we go. And then sparkling water. Cold sparkling water. Now this is corn flour in here. You can mix and match it if you want, but cold sparkling water. And what will happen, it'll go really thick to start off with. So what you want to do is just add enough to create this sort of thinnish batter. The thing is with this is you don't want to make it too thick like that. You want to make it quite thin, which is what that is. So as it starts to whisk together, you see that's quite thin now. It's thinner than a sort of chip shop batter, if that makes sense. So it's actually quite thin. You're looking at that sort of, as it drips down. I'll just show you with a spoon what I mean. But it's more of a tempura style batter, though. It's quite thin, which that is. And then what you want to do is you take your, your soft shell crabs. Now these have been defrosted, obviously. Um, and what you want to do is take these and dry them out a little bit. So defrost and dry. Um, you can cut them in flour as well if you want to do first. But what we're going to do is just take these into our batter. And then very, very hot oil. That's the key to this. Very little batter, if that makes sense. So you can eat the entire thing of a soft shell crab. So what you want to do is put these really, really hot oil straight in. Better to do these in batches as well. So when they go straight in the fryer like that, cook them for about two minutes and then do another batch. So you can see for this, the batter's just a very, very light little protection on it. And they don't take very long to cook at all. So as soon as they're cooked, which is no more than about Look at that, a minute and a half, look at that, straight out. You get this beautiful colour to it as well. I remember having soft shell crab at Wolfgang Puck's restaurant. There's a special treat once in Beverly Hills, he invited me to his restaurant. It's absolutely delicious and it looks similar to that. And all you do with these, when they're out, a sprinkling of salt over the top like that, and then you can pile these on the plate. Like that. And then you sprinkle them with a little bit, again, same sort of flavor that I've got with our nice little bit of crab in the oven, some chili, some spring onions, a little bit of coriander as well, chopped up. And sprinkle all that over the top. And then what I love with this is the spice, sriracha, that chilli sauce. You put a little bit of that over the top. That and a wedge of lime. <gasps> 
dinner at my house. Oh, that's amazing. I love dishes like this. So that's your deep fried soft shell crab. Absolutely delicious. That's going to be about another sort of 20 seconds. Well, I'll just show you the brown crab over here. Now, predominantly the white meat is in the claws. The dark meat is in the shells. So to get this out, if you are faced with a crab like this, I find the best way is either a spoon, I like to use an oyster knife, going through the back like that, put it underneath the carcass, feed it underneath the, the, the actual body here. I've actually shown you how to prepare one of these before and you just pop it out of its shell. Now, in here, this is where you'll get all that dark meat. So don't sort of tip that over. You want all that flavor in there as well. And all the, in the inedible bit is just here. So you just press this part, which is the head bit, get rid of that. Everything else in here is edible. People say about these dead man fingers over here, they're not inedible, they're just quite unpleasant to eat. They're not poisonous, they won't do anything to you, but they'll just, they're just not very nice to eat. So the good rule of thumb is just to remove these anyway. So if you then want to take the dark meat out, which is predominantly in the shell over here, the white meats are all in the legs. That's why the white meat becomes highly, highly prized. But you break these, open the claws up, and pick out all the meat. It's all in the shell over here. So you can cut this in half and really get in there and pick this. It's one of the real joys of eating, I think, as a whole crab like this, when you go and pick it. It's absolutely delicious. But like I said, there are so many, so many different types, but I love it. It's one of my favorite, favorite ingredients in the world. And you take your lovely, look at this. This is when you take your potted crab like that, your cooked hot potted crab with the melted butter over the top. But this is amazing as a little snack, as a little dish. It's a wonderful little treat, this. And let's face it, you can buy the little crab from the supermarket now already prepared, but don't forget, wherever possible, look out for these sort of little small, little soft shell crabs as well. As well as the small little sand crabs, you can do so many different things with it. But there you have it, some of my favorite dishes are using my favorite ingredient. Crab, done. Oh. There we have it. Now, if there's anything you'd like to learn about in the mask class, do get in touch with yourself. We're going to help out right here on the show. It's one of my favourite things to eat, that. Time now for a quick break. Join me again in a couple of minutes when my old mate Nick Nairn will be firing up the stoves one more time. I'll see you in a bit. Welcome back. Now we're chatting some more to Denise Van Elton and serving up Beef Wellington for her very shortly. But first, I'm here in the kitchen, who was one of the youngest Scottish chefs to win a Michelin star. He's not so young now, though, but he's still serving incredible food. It's my good mate, Mr Nick Nairn! Yeah. Thank you, thank you. I saw you looking at that little legend over there, that amazing little I, menu I over there. I know, I know. Is that original? It's that's one. an original yeah, menu. That's his signature. That was from his restaurant, there we go, in Clifton. Yeah. Uh, there we go. It's even signed by him as well, signed by the great man as well. So, an amazing man. Well, we've got legends in the kitchen as well. Uh, you're here. What are you going to be making for us? So this is a simple dish from new restaurant, making his best seller. It's char-grilled chicken, char-grilled veg, uh, chilli, garlic, lemon. I mean, if you were in France, it'd be a paillard. But yeah. it's, we put it on the menu as a paillard. Never <laughs> sold, then I just said char-grilled chicken flying out the door. <laughs> so if you put you... it on the menu for a paillard, yeah. it didn't sell. Char-grilled chicken flew out. Out the door. Out Brilliant, the door. love it, love it. If you could do me some char-grilled veg, kind of Mediterranean veg, so courgette, peppers, aubergine. Yeah. Potatoes, obviously the potatoes got to cook them beforehand because they won't cook in time. Um, I will get the marinades done, so it's a little bit of lemon zest, and if you've got unwaxed uh, lemons, so much the better. But actually, um, ordinary lemons do just fine. But so was, tell me about your, about your life uh, early on, before you were a chef. You were in the, the Navy, weren't you? Yeah, I was in the American Navy for seven years. I was a navigator, not a chef. Right. Um, not a very good navigator, I have to say. Um, Sense the directions. You don't have lasted long if you're a bad navigator, do you? <laughs> well, nearly... nearly um, um, I nearly went aground once. Right. Uh, I never, never told you this before, <laughs> but... Uh, so there's a thing called an, an azimuth, as you're going along a bit of, of land, and the azimuth is when you change course, and you change course to the next course. I was going along a bit groggy, and I changed course to the azimuth, so I went straight towards the land, and I'm making a cup of tea, and I'm like, geez, that doesn't look great. So, <laughs> emergency, <laughs> full to starboard. Ship leans over this, captain's having his tea, comes running up to the bridge with half his tea on his face, yeah. and he goes, what has going on? By that time, I straightened up and said, absolutely nothing, captain, it's all under control. He walks out the bridge and looks behind us, this huge big S-Pen <laughs> all boiling up. 
So that was your that was your merchant career over then. Uh, well, it was the writing was in the wall at that point. <laughs> okay. It wasn't my my kind of strong point. <laughs> um, so just a little bit of oil on the veggies. I've got so much to do. I don't need an awful lot. So so going from there, really. What what I mean, working in restaurants and bits and pieces. To... No, just love food. And um, but there's love food to be to be to get an emission start. How did that happen, or it just happened by <laughs> just it just uh, so. I decided I was going to open a restaurant. We had an old building that my father had bought, didn't know what to do with. We converted it into a restaurant. We opened the door. I couldn't cook. Honestly, I never could. So I the, love the, this. The day before we opened, I'd been painting the doors, and I just suddenly realised I'd never cooked for more than four people. And uh, so... The day before you opened? Yeah. Love it. Uh, I had a wee go um, cooking for my mum on a raga, but that didn't end well because <laughs> I'd never used an aga before, so <laughs> they were sitting there for two or three hours waiting for their main course. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but it just when it when I started cooking, I just suddenly realised that, that that was my thing. Yeah. And I got obsessed with it, absolutely obsessed with it. That thing that's in you, that chefy thing. In fact, when I first met you, you just come from Tuton and you had that two thousand yard stare that it's it's just your life. Yeah. There is nothing else but food. It's the most important thing. Yeah. So and, and the two thousand yard stare, that's yeah. what it <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, true though, isn't it? Because you don't think about it. There's nothing else. No, 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 and, uh, you know, you were very young as well, if I remember. Well, it was 20, 21, yeah. 21, I think, Crazy. when I first, we yeah. first met. Yeah, but you exactly. did have the right look, but that's slightly scary sort of thing. So <laughs> that's the oil, <laughs> the garlic, the chilli. Um, yeah. The chicken, I'm just going to split that in two, uh, just in here. So this is the paillard bit, is this it? Is this is the paillard, yes. Uh -huh. Right. Um, and as I say, in, in France, it would be a kind of recognised thing. Less so in the UK. Um, you can give us a wee... Tap out. Now, obviously, this industry has not been gone through the easiest of times, but ah. I mean, for anybody, yeah. you're, you, I mean. Well, throw in the mix uh, a flood, fairly yeah. sort of biblical flood, and a fire, which, uh, well, you must have seen in the news because you texted me to say, yeah. you know, you're okay. Um, so, restaurant Bridge Valley burnt to the ground. Um, the this happened school. extremely fast. Yeah, within about five minutes of it starting, the whole thing was properly ablaze. I mean, it was just... Uh, when we, we were at the other restaurant, Jules and I, yeah. and when they phoned and said, we're not going to lie, it's not good, Jules jumped in her car and she drove out to the restaurant. We're about 20 minutes away. I finished sending the food, jumped in my car, started driving out, and I was on the phone to her, and she, she got to Stirling, and you can see over the hills to Bridge of Ireland. She said, oh, my gosh. It's just smoke the whole way up. It's just so we knew it was pretty bad. And Ten of course, the cookery edges. school as well. I mean, that must. Yeah. You, you're doing that for uh, the nature of it is. I mean, it's well, perfect storm. A total perfect storm. And you know, we've had to adapt. So we've turned the cook school into a restaurant. The cook school will come back. You know, it will reopen. Uh, well, it will because I can say to you right now, I'm, I'm here now. I've done, I've done. I did a cook school for you. I'm going to come did. back because I really enjoyed it. It was uh, fantastic, mate. You, and you were brilliant with the guys. The, I don't think the guys could believe at the end that you just went through and hung out with them and sat and chatted. And uh, you know, they well, were Nick's like, "It's a long way for me to go home, isn't it? Really? It's <laughs> <laughs> from <laughs> really, really. What else could you do? Yeah. What else am I going to do? <laughs> when Nick Name buys you a drink, I'm going. I can't oh. go. Home. I can't go. I can't go home until he takes me to the airport. Yeah, I've got my, I've got my pocket stitched shut. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. So, so tell us about what you're doing then. What, what you got so, here? So, uh, this is the chicken. It's just uh, half chicken breast. Just batter it out a little bit thinly, so it cooks nice and quickly. And it's been marinated with the olive oil, good quality olive oil, not yeah. the Greek stuff. We've got the Italian stuff now. Right, okay. uh, uh, lemon zest, uh, garlic, chili, a little bit of lemon juice, and a little bit of salt just before we go to cook. Yeah. Nice and hot grill or grill pan. Yeah, I mean, you can do this in an ordinary pan if you want, but it, the char grill gives it that lovely kind of seared flavour. I also get these lovely kind of lines on it as well. So. And the deal is with the fire, it, it cooks nice and evenly and quickly. Yeah. So pretty much by the time you've got the bar marks on it, it's ready to uh, to turn. And when the second time's done, it, it's finished. And we were talking minute, minute, minute not, yeah. yeah, minute, minute and ish. A couple yeah. of minutes each side. Yeah. Does make a little bit of smoke. Do we have fire alarm issues here? At all? No, but we have um, autocube there, which may may struggle oh, a little minute. Okay. It's okay. fine. <laughs> that is fine. Try to dissipate that uh, <laughs> a little bit. But that, that sound and that smell and that sizzle is great news because yeah. that means it's cooking a really nice set. So, high so 2022 is going to be better than the last two years for you. It's, it's got to be better, James. Yeah, it's got to be, hasn't it, really? Um, yeah, but, so, I mean, 
you're a, you're a big big lover of uh, of the produce in there. We've been watching you as well on television. You've got you've been filming as well using the amazing produce you got up in the Yonica of the Woods. Yeah, we've uh, we've had a series. Of, uh, a mate of mine, you think you've met Doogie Doogie Vipon. He uh, still is the drummer in Deacon Blue, the rock band, 1980s. Yeah. Anyway, we make a thing called the Great Food Guys, and uh, we've done three series. And it's it's done all right. Yeah, and it looks great. It looks great fun to do. Yeah, and we're starting doing... We've got another thing, I think, called Bridges to Bridges, cycling from the Fourth Road Bridge to the Tay Bridge and going all around the coast of uh, Fife. Right. Dropping off at the nice restaurants and stuff, so... Cos cos where you live, I mean, it's just... I mean, you know that I love Scotland. You know that I'm yeah, a big fan yeah. of Scotland. I absolutely adore it. The place, the food, the amazing... I mean, you you have... Uh, if, if, there's a, if there's a country in the world that's got... The, Probably the most perfect ladder. I think Scotland's not far off it, do you think? I, I, I think so. I mean, uh, France and Italy and Spain have all got some, some, some fantastic stuff. But there is just something about the Langoustines. You know, I remember we were up filming in uh, Orkney, and you, the, just the quality of the stuff, you just walk to the, 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 the pier and get it off the boats. Um, it is extraordinary. And when you get produce that good, you don't do, need to do anything too fancy. But you've got the meat, but you've got the veg, you've got the potatoes, but you've got. We've also got amazing fruit. I mean, we have soft I, fruit. I, I say about this, this, the Scottish raspberries. I think they're the greatest in the world. Oh, well, the climate change is working really well for us in Scotland. So <laughs> soft fruit, strawberries and raspberries and blueberries as but well. There's that that valley. Where where, where is that for the soft? So fruit? The, there's there's Blair Gowrie, which is the sort of original thing. But as the climate changes, it's moving further north. Right. So Fife is great for, for berries as well. You know, and, and what I want to do moving forward is I want to start growing more food and I'd like to spend more time in the garden because I think when you... It's called age. It's called yeah, age. It's yeah. It's called it's age, Nick. That's what it is. It's definitely... It's it definitely... starts off slowly with a waistcoat to, to, <laughs> keep, to keep your belly in. We both noticed that. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know what you're talking about. Don't get the uh, side uh, angle. That's what it is. But anyway. Um, right. okay, so, got, so the veg has gone straight on there. Yep. I bet it's going to come back off on. Almost ready, ready to plate now. Isn't it? Yeah. Really? This is all done. Um, so I, I've got aubergine, and I've got potato, I've got red onion, I've got peppers. Okay, Doesn't well, really matter, James. It's the technique that's kind of uh, important. So the potatoes been been parboiled before we check. Parboiled, char grilled. yeah. Grilled it, of course, yeah. Plate to uh, to go, yeah. and then just a bit of uh, aubergine, pepper on here. The potatoes it kind of needs a little bit of starch this dish, I think. Yeah. And and then just take the, the chicken. And pills. the chicken, just say you marinate this in what again? Olive oil, yeah. lemon juice, garlic, and uh, and chili. Yeah. And, uh, I, you know, there was a time where I was really obsessed with sort of presentation and uh, making sure that I had little sauces and things like that. And, you know, I've kind of, thank you very much, I, I've, I've kind of grown up a bit now and I'm, I'm, it doesn't really bother me much. I get more pleasure out of cooking really quite simple food. Yeah. And this oil is good, is important because there's no real sauce with it. So that's so a little a bit of chopped parsley over the top? Yep, a little bit of parsley, a little bit of oil, and finally, a little bit of squeeze. Of, uh, of lemon juice, and our work here is done. So give us the name of this dish. So it's uh, chicken paillard with chargrilled vegetables, extra virgin olive oil, and a little bit of lemon. Right, I'm hungry, so we'll look at here this Here we go, thing. mate. So that's one of the best sellers on <laughs> our, our new menu, and it's all supermarket ingredients, there's nothing fancy about it, you know, and it, it, it's just that, that char grill, that high temperature, and it is a bit smoky. I, I and know. it tastes absolutely delicious as well. Nick Nan, everybody. Yay. Well, best of luck with everything. Best of luck, and Thank see you again soon. Yeah. Best of luck. There we go. Uh, right, we've still got time for one more final dish. We'll join me and Denise Van Elton is back in the kitchen where we took into a beef Wellington in a couple of minutes. I'll see you in a bit. This is this will do for starter. <laughs> hmm. Welcome back to the last part of the show. But I'm back in the kitchen. It's the one and only Denise Manelton. <laughs> Good to have you on the show all morning. We're going to do a wonderful little dish. This is Beef Wellington. Who's not going to like Beef Wellington? We've got some beautiful Beef Wellington over here with some spinach, some mushrooms, some pate. Nice little sauce to go with it. I'm going to show you how to assemble it. But it starts off with a fillet of beef. I'm going to get that sealing in a nice hot pan. So just a little bit of oil to start with in the pan. You can do it in the butter if you want. I'll do it in half and half. Why not? That'll go in there. And I'm going to fry that off. And then I've got my little duck cellar mushrooms, which are really, really simple. So you want to get that nice and hot. 
Taking the mushrooms really for these. These are I like using brown cap for mushrooms for this. Uh, you can use the white mushrooms if you want. I think brown cap are nice because they love the earthy sort of flavour. So we've got in here. Now what we also got is a centre cut of fillet. Centre cut of fillet is that, where it's been the, the end bit is called a Chateaubriand. Uh, where there's tall bit, uh, the small bits, uh, uh, the tail end of the fillet, they're used for filet mignon, which you've got over here. Um, because of that, you would use it for stroganoff and tartare and that kind of stuff. But what you want to do with this is get a nice hot pan, first of all, and season it really, really well. Now, the important thing is season it really well, but do this last minute, because otherwise it draws the moisture out of it if you're not careful. So plenty of salt and pepper. And I mean, get some salt and pepper in there, like that. And then we're going to seal that off in the hot pan to get it nicely coloured in there like that. The mushrooms are just going to blend. You can chop these all up. But the key to this really, though, is don't blend, uh, don't um, put, add the water to it or don't wash them because the water will just come out and you'll just need loads of stuff. So you don't wash them. Also, you don't peel them, do you? Don't peel them and don't wash okay. them, yeah. Okay. The mushrooms contain an awful lot of natural water anyway. And you notice that when you're frying them, if the pan's not hot enough, you just get this horrible foamy stuff on the, on the mushrooms. And what you want to do with this is do it quite dry, because otherwise it all everything's about taking as much moisture out of it as possible, because that's what's going to make the pastry soggy, and that's where you, you will get a nice beef wellington. But you want to get a nice bit of colour on it like that. And then we're going to use this to then fry up our mushrooms in here. So you brought out this fantastic book. This is, this is a new venture for you. This is, this is a little bit about your life story. And I've known you for all these years. I didn't know you were doing certain things in here. Oh, what certain things? Well, I didn't know about <laughs> Neighbours, for one. Oh, that I'd been in Neighbours. I, I knew you were in the EastEnders and stuff like that, but I didn't know about Neighbours. Yeah. And, of course, it's now just, just been... It's not been... It's been called from the UK, has yeah, it? Yeah, still... from the UK. Nothing to do with me. I wasn't responsible. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to put that out there. It was a while back that you were on it, but... <laughs> no, do you know what? I went over to Australia. I recorded in... Um, I was in Australia in 2019 filming and then I was on air in 2019 and then 2020 so I absolutely loved it it was an amazing experience but also for me as well because I know Jason Donovan known Jason for years so his daughter is an actress and she plays Harlow in Neighbours and she was playing my daughter so I'd really unusual moments and like moments when you're just thinking this is a bit bizarre you know and you're sitting in the green room and I've got Jason on FaceTime talking to his daughter and I'm there on the neighbour's <laughs> set and you're like how did this happen you know it's Scott Robinson what what out of everything you've done what what is what is the one that you love the most because this be... show James no come on can we, can, can we, this, this is the this, highlight of my career do you know what, out of all the stuff I've done and I've done I've, I've done television for, for 30 years this to be honest is my favorite show because it's everything I know it's 30 years down the line, but it's everything you've learned and you've almost gone back to the stuff that you love. And I went in this job because I fell in love with food, but I find people fascinating. So to be able to do that and do it in the comfort of your own home, it's much more a relaxed atmosphere and all the other stuff that I've ever done, which is you have the stress before you even start because you go into a different place, you're working on different equipment. You, it's all a bit stressful before you start. This is much more chill there. And I get the feeling you're like that. The minute you step foot on stage, it's your I happy love place. It. Even just with, you know, the cabaret show that I've been doing for the past couple of years, I loved it. Again, like you said, it was my happy place. I love going out on stage, I love performing, I love the interaction with the audience. I like anything that is live because you get a bit of a buzz from it. And also, if something goes wrong, it doesn't matter. You just move on from it. Yeah. So I do, I just enjoy any live performance, live radio, live TV. Live but then music. I suppose in, in the cabaret and that kind of stuff and the West End sort of stuff, and you've done everything, like I said, from Broadway, you've done some amazing things. Can you make that sort of character your own? Are you allowed to make that your own? Is, there must be an element of where, yeah, uh, Sir Andrew Lloyd Webber just goes, do you know what, we, this is the character, but, but we'll allow you a little bit of freedom. There must be a little bit of that. Yeah, you find your own creative process and you bring something to a character. For instance, when I did Chicago, um, when the film then came out with Catherine Zeta-Jones and Renee Zellweger, because I knew I might possibly go back and do Chicago again, I've never seen the film because I had my own way of performing Roxy, the character. So I tend to not watch other performers doing a part if I'm going to play it or I've played it. So back to the book then, it, was, it, was it kind of a, a difficult thing for you to do? Was it a difficult... Because a lot of people, when they think about uh, uh, doing a book like this, going, no, I, I, I don't want to do it, I don't want to do it yet, or something like that. Was that did, you, did you instantly say yes to it, or was that something that...? Well, I've been asked before over the years and been approached, and I always thought... I felt like there were more things I wanted to do with my career and also in your personal life as well. You know, you get to an age where 
you know, I'm 48 this year and I was like... 48? You know, I'm 50 this year. <laughs> 50. But, you know, I just feel like now I have got a story to tell in terms of, like, a lot of the work that I've done, people I've worked with. And also there's a lot of, um, you know, especially some of my relationships, like in the 90s, for instance, there were some things that were put in the press that weren't true and I just wanted to just kind of set the record straight on a few things as well on some personal issues and situations I've been put in and but, found but, myself in. But back then, it was just a... It was a crazy time for you. There wasn't... You know, you, every newspaper that you picked up, you were in it. Yeah, in fact, every Johnny Vaughan single... said at the Big Breakfast, there's one of the national newspapers, and he started calling it the Daily Denise. Because <laughs> it was like... <laughs> it was every day there was something in the paper. Um, but we were very lucky. I mean, The Big Breakfast was such a brilliant show to work on. Obviously, there's a lot of stories in there, in the book, about my time at The Big Breakfast with Johnny. And I mean, the 90s were just so much fun. But there's a time and a place to do things, and that time for you, that Big Breakfast thing, straight after the Chris Evans thing, you know, that was a perfect time for you to do that, that yeah. show, don't you think? Yeah, it was a great time to do it. But we're also very, very lucky, because at that time, in the 90s, people never really had, like, mobile phones, so you could get away with a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so we was quite naughty. So it's, a, it's an interesting read. It is. It is a very, very interesting read as well. But look, you've got your nice little bit of pastry. So the idea is you just bring this all up. You don't have to be too fancy with it. You're creating a nice little parcel with this, and it's a good idea to get in the habit of doing anything with anything with pastry like this. Uh, anything on croup, whether you're doing a large one or a small one. Always try and do it on greaseproof paper like this because the greaseproof paper is quite important. When you put it in the fridge and let it set, you can then take it out. When you cook it, you cook it onto a hot tray. So you preheat the tray in the oven, like that, and then you slide the paper onto a hot tray. That's why it stops the pastry from going soggy underneath. So once we got to that stage... You don't want soggy bits, James. You don't want soggy, soggy pastry, exactly that. So while that's happening, I'm just going to cover this and we're just going to make a nice little sauce with this. So we've got some red wine and some Madeira that we've got in here, like that. So a little bit of red wine, a little bit of Madeira, like that. And we're just going to cover this over the top. Now, we did mention a little bit about this film that you were going to be doing. Yes. So, but we didn't get around to who was in it and everything else. Tell, can you tell us about this film that you're up to? Because you're incredibly busy with that. Yeah, so um, it's not a huge part. It's a British comedy with the brilliant Jennifer Saunders and Ed Sheeran's in it. There's a few different cameos. I think they're, they're going to be announced in some of the others soon. But, yeah, it's a, a British comedy. And I actually love being part of film as well. I find it very interesting watching a film come together. So is there anything you, you, you want to do in life? Because I look at, look at you, you, you said you're 48. You've done so much uh, doing what you've done. Is there anything you'd like to do or is there anything you...? I would now, at this age, I would love to do a sitcom. I did one years ago in the 90s called Babes in the Wood that was on... You'd be great at that. You know? Yeah, but I would like to do one now cos I really enjoyed it. I mean... Why, it... why now as opposed to...? Because I'm enjoying doing more acting. Yeah. I love comedy and I just feel like, because I'm a little bit older, with experience and everything, I think my, my acting ability has changed. So I would like to do it now. I think I've learned a lot more about comedy timing and... I think you'd be great at it. I'd love to. I think you'd be great at it. So, this, you're taking the paella home for your folks. Do you want this one as well? I'll have the beef wellington. So put this in the fridge as well. <laughs> <laughs> put this in the... I just thought I'd ask. So oh, can... Kath and Ted. The, right. That's them sorted that's for the That's all right. You can have that as well. Anyway, so it was going to be fish and chips supper later, <laughs> wasn't it? But now you've got this. So, that's them cooking. Cook that for 30 minutes. Ideally, if you've got a, a, a probe, you're taking it about 40 degrees, something like in the centre, and when you take it out, it'll gradually get hotter. And then this is what Ooh, we end up... Oh, James, look at you that. You didn't see that one, did you? Oh, you <laughs> beauty! <laughs> look. We've got a nice... That looks amazing. Ooh, yes! Will the director enjoy your doner kebab? Because you ain't <laughs> getting any of this either. <laughs> but look at this. We just wow. take our... Bit of beef Wellington there. Voila! And, and it'll actually hold. So when, you, when you're making this, don't, don't be tempted as well to take it straight out of the oven and serve it straight away. Let it relax. Let it sit there for a good 10 to 15 minutes before you serve it. The sauce, I've reduced this down. We've got in here, I've got some Madeira, I've got some red wine, I've got some stock. We're going to finish this off. As I've said this before on the show, we call this Monte au beurre. It's just to finish your sauce off with butter as well. But um, also, because your mentor was here... Um, and I love Francesco. He did this amazing pasta dish. 
in a bush, which I've you will. I've had it. I've tried it before. He's I tried it. it. It's amazing. Well, <laughs> the thing about it is, what I love about Francesco, he brings it all in. He brings it, I've brought you this. Then he takes it all away. He brings it all, I've brought you this, and then takes it all away. But I managed to nick a truffle, truffle. off him. Still... <laughs> oh, well done. <laughs> this is... We've got a truffle. Does he know? Uh, no, he has no idea. But he will do when he watches this. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks, Francesco. Thank you very much. So this has cost you about 180 quid. <laughs> but lovely. And we just put that. He won't mind. He, he will, trust me. He, he will. won't mind if it's for me. Uh, he yeah, knows he I love yeah, my truffle. Yeah, he'll charge me, though. I know he will. But anyway, <laughs> okay. lovely chap. So we're just going to take a little bit of truffle in there. Salt and pepper over the top. So give us the name of the book then. I'll just a show you one more me, time. A, a bit of me. A bit of you. Yeah. And it, it is a fantastic, fantastic read. Thank and you. really, really interesting. If you thought you knew Denise, it's brilliant. It's yeah, there's, there's so much in there, actually, that even some of my friends don't even know about me. Yeah. You know, so it's... Um, I really enjoyed writing it. And, I, you know... Oh! Oh! I've been distracted. <laughs> Then, By the Wellington. Uh, yeah, exactly. We're just going to take a nice little bit. <laughs> oh, James, that looks incredible. Thank you very much. Look at that. We take a nice little bit of beef wellington on the plate like that. Beautiful. You see, by just leaving it, it stops it from bleeding as well. You don't get this out. But nice hot searing of the pan. And then you've got this... So you this... took that off the heat then, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, take this off the heat, add the butter, and then you pour that sauce around with it. And it's even better with a bit of Italian black truffle to go with it. <laughs> but there you have it. Francesco's truffle. Exactly, Francesco's truffle. There you have it, a classic, classic beef wellington, with our, or without the truffle. It's a perfect dish, that. It's not bad, that. Bon appétit. <laughs> Denise, bon appétit. Thank you very much. Dive into that one. Beef Wellington. <laughs> mm -mm. Mm. Fire, isn't it? Oh, it's so good. Happy with that? So good. It's yeah. delicious. Happy with that? Good. Yep, very happy. Good. Well, congratulations, everything. And, and best Thank of luck you. with the film as well. Best of luck with the book. It's brilliant. Thank Great you. To see, you. see you next time for the fourth time as well. Mm. In three weeks' I'm time. I'm leaving the I know she's not leaving. I know she's not leaving. <laughs> That's it. That's all we've got time for today. A massive thank you to all my guests, Jess Lee Wilson, Francesco Matze, Nick Ned, and, of course, Denise Van Elm. Yeah. Uh, right, we'll see you back here same time next Saturday morning where we'll be joined by more top chefs, other brilliant guests. Until then, take care. Stay safe, everybody. Thanks for watching.